Lenten Spiritual Practice, a hopeful look at the seven deadly sins. Today's attraction, lust. And it's also for mature audiences only. I am not kidding about that. Um, but as we're thinking about lust, is it really even such a big deal? Why is it a, considered a deadly sin? After all, it's mainly just in our minds, right? Is it really hurting anybody? Hi, I'm Dr. K.P. McKee. I'm the founder and executive director of A Spacious Place, Creativity and Spirituality Center. And as we walk through today's spiritual practice, we invite your questions and comments. We would love to hear from you. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. Our supplies for today are very simple and indeed, it's up to you if you even want to use these or not. Uh, one would be some writing paper and a writing utensil. And the other would be sketch paper and some kind of materials to use for sketching. And I'll get into that a little bit more later on. So when we're thinking about lust, we're thinking about a choice to fuel sensual desire as the, by objectifying another person. And I have our little image here that we can look at. Uh, and the word is used oftentimes also for desires of other kinds, like a lust for recognition or after that Lamborghini. We're going to focus today on the sexual connotation of lust because that's typically what it's understood as. And so as we begin, let's differentiate lust from sexual desire. So sexual desire comes to most of us humans in greater or lesser proportions as we reach a certain age. And it gives life spice and it reproduces our race. It's a healthful thing and nothing that we should be ashamed of. Lust bends desire by stoking and stroking the feelings by using another person as an object, even if it's just in our mind. And it doesn't matter whether that other person is encouraging that thought or not. Our thoughts are our own and they are our own responsibility. So let's look at whether or not that actually means it's a sin. Um, so as you remember, when we started talking about the seven deadly sins, we chose to define sin as that which keeps us from God's full hopes from us, that which keeps us from reaching our human potential, because those are two ways to look at the same thing. And so as we're looking at this, we can kind of look at it as a mathematical equation. So here's my low-tech uh, uh, visual aid here. So in God's mind, all persons have equal worth. Everyone is a child of God and a beloved child of God. When we are lusting, we are basically saying, I matter more than you because I intend to use you for my own gratification. So whenever our arithmetic doesn't align with God's arithmetic, we're not living into our full human potential. Therefore, it qualifies as a sin. And not only that, but lust is futile. And C.S. Lewis addresses this in his book, Mere Christianity, in his own humorous and inimitable style. And I'm going to read just a little piece of that from his uh, work on sexual morality. And this is what C.S. Lewis says. You can get a large audience together for a striptease act, that is, to watch a girl undress on the stage. Now suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing a covered plate to the stage and then slowly lifting the cover so as to let everyone see, just before the lights went out, that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country something had gone wrong with the appetite for food? And would not anyone who had grown up in a different world think that there is something equally queer about the state of sex instinct among us? One critic said that if he found a country in which such striptease acts were, with food were popular, he would conclude that the people of that country were starving. He means, of course, to imply that such things as a striptease act resulted not from sexual corruption but from sexual starvation. I agree with him that if, in some strange land, we found that similar acts with mutton chops were popular, one of the possible explanations would occur to me would be famine. 
But the next step would be to test our hypothesis by finding out whether, in fact, much or little food was being consumed in that country. If the evidence showed that a good deal was being eaten, then of course we should have to abandon the hypothesis of starvation and try to think of another one. In the same way, before accepting sexual starvation as the cause of the striptease, we should have to look for the evidence that there is in fact more sexual abstinence in our age than in those ages when things like the striptease were unknown. But surely there is no such evidence. Contraceptives have made sexual indulgence far more far less costly within marriage and far safer outside it than before, and public opinion is less hostile to illicit unions and even to perversion than it has been since pagan times. Nor is the hypothesis of starvation the only one we can imagine. Everyone knows that the sexual appetite, like other appetites, grows by indulgence. Starving men may think much about food, so, but so do the gluttons, the gorged, as well as the famished, like titillations. So because of that, we see things like pornography grow more and more violent because it takes more and more to titillate us. We are searching to find something and, and um, use sex to get it when actually God is the only answer to all of our needs. It is a God-shaped vacuum that we're trying to fill with sexual thought. Um, and the other issue is that uh, lust can be a gateway to other sins. And to think about that, we're going to turn to one of the Bible's grittier stories. And this is why I'm saying this is for mature audiences only. And in this story, we find King David. And it's great to me to think about this story because it reminds me that even our Bible's heroes were thoroughly flawed humans that we can relate to. King David is on the roof of his palace and he looks across to another house where he sees a beautiful woman at her bath. King David questions his household and discovers that the woman is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, who is at this moment at war for King David's army. Nevertheless, King David calls, orders Bathsheba over and has intercourse with her. We don't know whether she felt like she could say no we don't know whether she cared to say no. In time, she sends word to the king saying that she is pregnant. As a cover-up, King David sends for Uriah, tries to get him drunk, and entice him to sleep with his wife. Uriah's morality around war makes him decline. So now the king is in a bind. His solution is to tell his soldiers to fall back from Uriah in battle and let the enemy kill him. And that is exactly what happens. Uriah dies in battle. King David takes Bathsheba into the palace as his wife. The child is born, dies. Uh, and in time, Bathsheba has other children. So whatever the thought was that King David had in the beginning, he at least develops some respect for Bathsheba over the years. So in this case, lust moves to adultery, which moves to a cover-up, which moves to murder. But the story goes on. Years pass, and King David's, one of King David's wives has a son named Ammon. Ammon lusts after his half-sister Tamar, and so much that he finds he can't think of anything else. So he devises a plot telling Tamar that he is sick and that only she can provide him food that will help him in his weakness, he entices her into his room. He tries to seduce her, and when she rejects him, he overpowers her and rapes her. After Ammon has raped Tamar, his lust turns to loathing, and he throws her out of the room and bars the door. Tamar goes to her full brother, Absalom, tears her clothes and puts ashes on her head in her grief and lives the rest of her days there as a desolate woman. Absalom is enraged. He goes to his father, the king, and demands justice. But David, although David is angry, does nothing. Could it be the shadows of his feelings for Bathsheba that come to mind? We don't know. Uh, but Absalom's rage 
is fueled and he thinks and plans and over time, he convinces King David to let him take Ammon with him on a trip. While they are out, he gets Ammon drunk and then has his servants kill Ammon in an act of retribution. When King David finds out about what has happened, Absalom flees for his life, and in time, he puts together an army and attempts a military coup against his father. The coup fails, and one of David's men kills Absalom, which leads King David to say, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would that I have died and not you, O oh, Absalom, my son. This is a gritty and sad story. So where is the hope in something like this? Well, the hope is that God is for us. And we can trust God with all of our thoughts and our feelings because God knows them anyway and loves us just as they are. So we have some spiritual practices that can help us with our uh, dealing with lustful thoughts and can reconnect us with God. So to start, let's do this. Let's get some breathing done. Let's center ourselves in our chairs. And I like to have both feet on the ground. And we can have our hands open and our eyes cast down. And let's move our breathing from high up in here, where we're feeling, when we're feeling shamed or panicked, that's where we breathe, down into our lower abdomen and slow our breathing down. Let's take a breath. And we can lower our shoulders. And one more time. And when you're ready, you can look up. And I have some kind of goofy um, visuals to help us remember these spiritual practices, but hopefully they'll get us them in our mind. So the first one is that we would create a mantra. And I have my bleach here because it's a way of cleansing and pur purging our thoughts. So a mantra is a phrase that connects us with what matters most to us that we can say with the intake and outtake of a breath. So you want to keep it really simple. You can use a scripture if that's helpful to you. Um, you can also use something like in all things God, or God's will mine, or first love God. So if we're going to use the first one, in all things God, maybe in our as we breathe in, we think, in all things God, in all things, and in our outtake, God. So, in all things, God. And we just do that over and over again until we can feel ourselves recentered and our minds where we want them to be, where... Our will is at one with God. And the second thing is healthy choices. And I have my ball cap here to remind us of this one. So whenever we make healthy choices, when we get healthful exercise, enough rest, and when we eat well, then our desires tend to be healthy as well. So that's a very concrete thing that we can do to help ourselves. Um, and then the, the next one is to bring baking soda and not gasoline to the fire. So let's face it, sex is very interesting. That's why it's used to sell everything from automobiles to toothpaste. There's a glut of sex on television and all kinds of entertainment. So since we're dealing with it in our daily lives all the time anyway, let's not go out looking for it in addition to it. So that's one way we can think to put out the fire. All right, the next thing is whole person visualization. And I'll show this in just a minute, but I want to talk a, a little bit before I do that. We are each whole persons. And lustful thoughts generally originate in only thinking about certain parts of a person. What we see of them, what we hear, what we smell, taste, touch. But when we remember that each person is a whole person, that changes things. We are all persons who not only have a look on the outside, but we have internal organs that sometimes work well 
and sometimes don't. We all eat and defecate and sleep and age. We get sick. So, and that is the reason I have this image here. So if thinking about that person that you're having these desirous thoughts about getting sick and you tending to them makes you want to run for the hills, then it's a good sign that we need to examine our thoughts about that person if we're thinking about them as they deserve to be thought about. And then that moves us to whole creation realization. And for that, I have this amazing apple. Uh, and we can enjoy this with all of our senses and let it be exactly what it is. We don't have to objectify it. So we can enjoy the colors and the shape of this apple. We can feel the smooth skin as we're holding it. We can bite into it and feel it on our tongues and taste its deliciousness. And those kinds of delights to our senses are around us all the time. And sometimes we just don't even notice them. So to help us do that, sometimes it helps to just take your sketch pad out. And uh, I did a sketch of this apple. And the quality of the sketch is not the point here. The point is that I attended more deeply to this apple than I would have had I not taken time to draw it, its shape and its color. And uh, you could also write something about the apple if, you, um, if writing is a good art form for you. And then last, we want to bring the light to our thoughts. And this is very important because lust tends to be a hidden sin. And when we can bring it into God's healing light, then we can deal with it and get our priorities back where they need to be. And we can do that with a prayer. And I think it's important to write the prayer down because that brings light to what we're talking about. And here is one that I wrote. You're welcome to use it if you find it helpful. Uh, Lord, and use whatever word you use for the divine. In my lustful thoughts, I treated another person as an object for my sexual gratification. Forgive my lust. Help the person I lusted after grow into your full hopes for them. Help me grow into your full hopes for me. I want my will to be at one with yours. Amen. So just to review, we can do a mantra. We can have healthy habits. We can not put fuel on the fire. We can remember that each person is a whole person. We can appreciate and delight in God's whole creation with all of our senses. And we can bring God's light to our thoughts so that we can be make our wills at one with God's. So if you found that helpful, we hope you will like it on Facebook. And you can also review it on Facebook, on YouTube, and on our website, www.aspaciousplace.com. And next week, if we get around to it, we're going to do Sloth. Um, and then we have one more, Pride, will be the week after that. Also, if you live in the Austin area, we will be having our Holy Saturday Silent Prayer Centers on April 19th in the afternoon. And you are welcome to come and go or come and stay and spend some time in silence with God. Uh, so let's close with prayer. God, it is our greatest hope that our wills be at one with yours. Amen.